Good morning. Well, we've had a great time of worship, have we not? Oh, it's been incredible. It's been incredible. Well, I want to welcome all of you, and I want to say thank you so much for coming, and I want to welcome everybody who's watching online. We're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. If you're a guest here today, we especially want to welcome you, and I just want to say to you that immediately following our service, if you would head to the guest services, we've got some information for you. We've got a gift for you, and we just want to help you make a decision what's right for you. If you're looking for a church home, we're praying. Would you pray about making Central Community your permanent church home? Because we would love to have you. Now, one of the things that I am is I can be spontaneous. Sometimes that's good. For other people, it's not always so good. And today's an example of that. And so I want to introduce to you somebody real quick. Morgan, would you come up here real quick? I want to introduce to you, this is our brand new middle school youth director. Would you please welcome Morgan Pollock? Okay. She's scared I'm going to ask her a question or something like that, but I promised her I wouldn't do that. But Morgan, we are so glad to have you here, and we know that you're also going to be working with Pastor Jordan, not Justin. (laughs) But we just want to say welcome. So church, would you just make her feel welcome? Grab her, tell her hi, all that kind of stuff, but thank you. Welcome, okay? All right, we are in a series right now that's called Refreshment in the Psalms. And what we're doing is, as we begin our summer, we're wanting to find out from God's Word, what does it take for us to be refreshed? And last week, we talked about what does the Bible tell us about how we get refreshed? Remember, it was in Psalm 23. And the way that you get refreshed, the way you begin that process is you keep your eyes focused on and stay close to the shepherd. That's what we learned in Psalm 23. Now today, we're going to learn about what it means to not just get refreshed, but to stay refreshed. And we're going to learn that from Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 is one of my, or Psalm 1 is one of my favorite psalms of the 150 psalms. This is one of my favorites that we're going to learn about today. All right, now, I want to begin by asking you a question, and I'm going to tell you right away this is a foolish question, okay? So just bear with me because there's a reason why I'm asking it. And here's the question, okay? So would you rather be happy or would you rather be miserable? Now, I know you're asking me like, oh, that boy's been smoking something again, right? But I'm going to ask you that. So would you rather be happy or miserable? And the reason that I'm asking you that is because that's the question that the psalmist asks us today in Psalm, chapter, in Psalm 1. He asks us, would you rather be happy or would you rather be miserable? All right, now, I want to begin with a quote from one of my favorite theologians, because of my background, Martin Luther. Would you please just look at this? Look at what it says here. We go to the Bible as the shepherds went to the manger in order to find Christ. Would you agree with that? That's true. Our purpose, one of the reasons, the main reason that God gave us his word is because this is where we meet Jesus. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper with that and show you exactly how. In the Old Testament, Jesus is predicted, right? He's predicted as Messiah. In the Gospels, Jesus is revealed. In the Acts of the Apostles, Jesus is preached. In the epistles, in the letters, Jesus is explained. And in the book of Revelation, remember that Jesus is expected. So it's true, we can find Jesus in the Word of God, right? Well, not necessarily everybody. And here's what I mean by that. I want you to listen to a group of Jesus is talking about. He's talking to a group of Pharisees, and Jesus is speaking to them, and look what he tells them. He says, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Everybody hear that? You think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. What I want you to understand this morning is simply this. The Bible tells us that at the end of time, when we die, when we stand before our Lord, that no man will have an excuse 
Romans chapter 1 tells that, that man will be without excuse. In other words, you can't say, I didn't know. So when the God gave us his word, the Bible, in it we see the written word, but we also see the revealed word, which is the man, Jesus Christ. Amen? Everybody okay with that? Are we on the same page? Okay, now, let's go back to that question that I asked you earlier. Do you want to be happy or do you want to be miserable? Well, let me ask you, what is it then that's going to make you happy? A million dollars? Might help. Five million dollars? A hundred million dollars? What is it going to, that's going to make you happy? A new car, a new boat, a new home, somebody else's kids? You know what I mean? But what is it that is going to truly make you happy? So I did some research, and I wanted to find out what does the world tell us about what truly makes us happy. And I came up with the top three answers, okay? The first thing that the world tells us that makes us happy is family and relationships. In other words, you can experience true happiness when you spend time with family members and friends, and I would agree with that. I love to spend time with my family. I love to spend time with my, with my friends. I love to spend time with my grandkids. I, I love doing that, okay? So I would agree with that, okay? Now here's the second thing. The second thing that truly makes you happy, that you can experience happiness is this, that you have interesting work. In other words, think about this, that you are involved in some type of activity that causes you to lose track of time. Now just think about that for a moment. Are you involved in something that causes you, you love it so much that you don't even think of the time? And the third thing that makes you happy is random acts of kindness. You realize that when we play a role, when we have a part in making someone else happy, that makes us happy. We then experience happiness. All right, now let's go back to the word here. The very first word in Psalm 1 is the word blessed or blessed, okay? That word means extremely happy. It means extremely fulfilled. So one of the ways that we could begin this psalm is like this. How happy is the man who, now I don't know about you, but that tells me that I want to find out a little bit more about this psalm because I want to know the answer to that question, how happy is the man? So stand with me out of respect for God's word as I read Psalm 1, and I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version, the ESV, okay? Here we go. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is God's word his written word, and his revealed word for God's people. Let's pray together. Father, today it is my prayer that you would teach me about true happiness, but not from a world's perspective. I want to know what you have to say about true happiness, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, now the psalmist, as I told you, talks about the word blessed. That's the first word that he, that he begins with. 
But there's a theme, there's a point that he makes right away, and here's what he is saying to us as we read this. Blessed is the man. What he is telling us is this. There are only two ways to do life. Only two ways to do life. One of them is the way of the righteous, and the other one is the way of the ungodly. Only two ways. He talks about the way of the righteous in verses one through three, and in verses four through six, he talks about the way of the ungodly. There are only two paths in life. There are only two ways to do life, is what he tells us. Now, I find that interesting because the world tells us just the opposite. The world tells us there are many ways, there are many roads, there are many paths, and yet the Bible tells us that there are only two. This last week, I had the opportunity, I had the privilege, we had the privilege of hosting a funeral here last Monday. And it was for a a young man, 50 years old, who passed away of cancer, and you know what? He was an assistant um, superintendent for Goddard School District. This place was packed. We had people from all over the city and all over the state that came in to pay their respects. And what an opportunity for us as a church to share with them. And I want you to know, we talked about the path. In fact, one of the things that I shared with them was, in the words of Jesus, in John chapter 14, he says to us, He says that there is only one way to where he is going. Thomas asked the question, how do we get to where you're going? We don't know the way. And you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I want to tell you something. I believe that probably over half of the people that were here probably aren't a part of a church and maybe don't even know or call on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But I want to tell you something, whenever anybody comes in this room, what they want to hear is truth, and not the truth of what the pastor has to say, they want the truth of God's word. And once they have the the truth, guess what? They are without excuse. Okay, now they've been told there's only one way to the Father, and it's through Jesus Christ the Son. And so once again, the psalmist begins by telling us, you know what, there are only two ways to live your life. If you know your destiny, if you know where you're going when you die, and you know that you were created, now listen, in the image of God, if you know you were created in that image and you know your destiny, then the path becomes very obvious of how you are to live your life, right? So right here in the Bible, Psalm chapter one, or Psalm one, tells us that there are only two ways to live your life. And here are the examples. Look at the first one. This is in the Old Testament. And look at what Daniel says, okay? And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to the righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In the New Testament, look what it says here. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are you. It's true. There are only, indeed, two paths that we live. Getting back to that about what it is that we want to have that makes us happy, I want you to know that even our government in the Declaration of Independence has declared to us that we have a right to go after happiness. Did you know that? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, here's the thing that is actually kind of interesting is this. What they don't know and what they're going to learn is this. True happiness always ends in God. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Psalm. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. All right, 
So now the psalmist goes on, and what he does now is he begins to describe a man. He tells us, blessed is a man, and then he gives us three things. In other words, he's talking about a spiraling downward. My dear friends, the psalmist is talking about the stages or the progression that, fall, that lead us into sin, and this is how he describes it. First we walk, then we stop and stand, and finally we sit. What he's describing for us is the progression downward in sin. Now let's look at the very first verse here. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now here's what the writer of the psalm is saying. The very first step in the progression of sin is this, it's influence. In other words, you are walking with people. You are walking with individuals. You are in their counsel. And because you are in their counsel, you hear their language, you hear their crass jokes, and what happens is you begin to laugh at sin. Sin no longer has its jagged edges. You become soft on sin. And guess what happens? We are influenced by them. Well, the second step then is that we next identify with them. First we walk with them, then we identify with them. And what happens there is that their lifestyle becomes our lifestyle. Their attitudes become our attitudes and their habits become our habits. And then the psalmist says, so once you've begun this journey, the last thing is, is you become like them. So the psalmist is telling us is that this is the progression of sin and it goes from bad to worse. Now listen very carefully, okay? Don't miss this. The psalmist is talking about a person. He's talking about a person. Let's go on now. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. When all that he does, he prospers. So now the psalmist goes from the don'ts to the do's. And what's the do? Here's what he says. He says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law, he meditates day and night. Now, I want you to listen very carefully, okay? You said you wanted to be happy. Well, if you want to be happy, what we're learning then is this. The Bible is a means to an end. The end is a relationship it's an experience with the living God. Do you understand that? Here's what I mean. I want to know the word of God so that I can know the God of the word. Did you hear that? I want to know the word of God because as I know the word of God, then I get to know the God of the word. And the Bible tells us, the psalmist tells us, you wanna be happy, guess what? That's where you live. But he doesn't stop there, does he? He goes on and he kinda of uses a funny word and the word is meditate. Well, we've heard about the definition for meditate. Meditate like, okay, you know, like a cow chews on its cud, he swallows it and then he brings it back up again and chews on it some more and then swallows it. That's kind of gross. But I wanna share with you a definition that I found this week that I absolutely love. And I hope you will adopt it because I have. And here's the definition of meditate, okay? I talk about what I'm eating. Mmm. I talk about what I'm eating. So yesterday, my wife was home and I was working on my message in the morning and I came home and Lori was out running around with uh, Nicole and, and, and her sister and all of a sudden I had been hot and I was sweaty and I was really hungry and opened up the refrigerator and nothing. <laughs> you ever have that feeling? When you sit there and you look and you look and you can't find anything and that's kind of how I felt. And then all of a sudden I got a craving watermelon. Yeah. Oh, okay. So here's what I did. So I texted my wife and I said, Lori, would you do me a favor? Would you bring me some watermelon home? And she said, sure, I'd be glad to. Oh, isn't she sweet? <laughs> so she finally gets home. She brings the watermelon in 
and I take the watermelon in and it has a chill to it. So I dive in, I get this big old honker knife and I dive into it and I cut it and I cut it into slices and I realize when I cut it, it's the most beautiful red I've ever seen in my life. And there were no seeds. (laughs) So as I cut it up, I got this big piece and it's all watermelon and as I pick it up, I mean, it's just dripping. And I put it in my mouth. Oh, wait a minute. Before I put it in my mouth, sorry, I put a little salt on it. Now I put it in my mouth and it just explodes. I'm telling you, it was the greatest feeling I've had and it quenched not only my hunger but my thirst. That's what it means to meditate. It just means that you talk about what you're reading. I'm in the Old Testament right now and I'm just kind of reading, I'm just kind of taking my time and I'm just kind of pacing it and I'm in 1 Samuel right now. And in 1 Samuel, you remember that the Israelites came to Samuel and they said to him, we want a king. Remember that? Samuel then had to go to the Lord. And it was not something that Samuel was looking forward to. You want to know why? Because he knew it was going to break God's heart. So Samuel goes to the Lord and he says, Lord, your people want a king. And here's the reason. They said they want a king because they want to be like everybody else. And then the Lord says to Samuel, he says, Sammy, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But God decides to give them what they want. And so they go through the process, and you know the process. So there's this man, his name is Kish, and he's got a couple donkeys, and he loses them. So he sends his son Saul out to go and look with him along for a servant. And they go along, and they can't find him anywhere. And finally they come to a city where there's a man there named Samuel, and he's called the seer. So they said, let's go and talk to him, and let's ask him about the fact about where our donkeys are. Now the Lord had told Saul that, or excuse me, told Samuel that when Saul comes, he's, he was going to point him out to him. And so here comes Saul. The Bible tells us he was head and shoulders above everybody. She's a very handsome man. And the Lord says to Samuel, he goes, that's him. And so Samuel takes him and he ends up anointing him. And then there is something that happens in verse 9 of chapter 10 that just grabbed a hold of my heart. And it was this. After Saul left Samuel's presence, now listen, God changed his heart. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh God, I need my heart changed. If I had my heart changed, I'd treat my wife better. I'd treat my children better. I'd treat my staff better. You know, Lord, I really need a heart change. That's what it means to meditate. So I want to challenge you this week. I want you to take the Word of God, and as you go through the Word of God, as you meditate on it, I want you to talk to your spouse. I want you to talk to your friend. I want, to talk, I want you to talk to you. I want you to talk about what it is that you read. And I just want you to describe them. Just simply tell them what you're eating so they too can say, mmm, I'd like to have some of that. I love to do this with my grandkids. I'll take something, candy bar, something like that, and I'll just chew it and I'll just start going, mmm, mmm, mmm. What are you eating, Bob? Bob? Mm-hmm. I want some, right? And that's exactly what we do in God's Word. We tell people about what we're reading. We tell them about how good it is. Why? So that they will want some. Now look at this verse here. Don't just read the Bible. Feed on the Bible. All right, now. So the question is that a lot of people ask is, okay, so if I'm going to read the Bible, then what's going to happen? And the Bible tells us, says, you know what? He says, you're going to be like a tree that is planted by streams of water. Okay, let me just tell you something. In the Bible days, a tree represented something firm, strong, and now listen, unmovable. 
And so the Bible tells us, the psalmist tells us, says, if you are doing this, if you're feeding on the word God, you're going to be by a tree, but this tree is going to be planted right next to the water. And the roots of this tree are going to go down deep. In fact, they're going to go right into the source of its nourishment, which is God and his word. And the Bible tells us that this word is go- this, this nourishment will never end. And that's what the psalmist says. If you want to be happy, if you truly don't want to be miserable, then you're feeding on God's word. And here's the result. You will be like a tree. And the first thing he tells us, three things that are happening. Number one is this. He says, first thing that happens is you will bear fruit. And what does that mean? It means results. It means in your life, because of who you are, because you are feeding on God's word, you can expect to see results. You can expect to see lives change because of what the nourishment is doing through you in the lives of other people. You know what the second thing is? Health. And what I mean by that is you will be refreshed. You will do a whole lot less, but you will accomplish a whole lot more because you will be refreshed. And the third thing is this, you'll be blessed. In other words, you're gonna have success. Do you really wanna be happy? Then you're gonna feed on God's word. And as you feed on God's word and meditate on it, you're gonna be like a tree. You're gonna bear fruit, you're gonna be refreshed, and you're going to experience great success. Now here's what the psalmist is describing. He's describing the balanced life where God is at the center. It's not Bob that's at the center who has to juggle everything. No, God is at the center and he controls everything. All right, we're almost done here. Last thing. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish, okay? Now what the psalmist does, he brings in and he talks about opposites, okay? What was the very first word of the psalm? Blessed. You know what the last word is? Perish. You see, he's talking about two different lifestyles, complete different lifestyles. He says, you know what? He says, you can choose to be like the tree or there's something else that you can choose to be like, and the psalmist uses the word chaff. You know what chaff is? It's just husk. It's worthless. It's a thin skin that goes around the head of grain. And so what happens is this, is that in the days of Jesus, in in the old days, in the ancient days, they would build what they called their threshing floors, and they would put them on top of the hills. And the reason they put them on top of the hills is because there's always a breeze blowing through. So they would take their wheat, they would bring it in, they would take their winnowing for it, and they would throw the wheat in the air. That breeze would come through, and it would separate the chaff from the wheat, and the heads of grain would then fall to the ground. And then what they would do is they would collect the chaff. You know what they would do with it? They would burn it. And the psalmist says, that's the life of those who will perish. I want you to think about something. The ungodly cannot stand in difficult times. Do you understand why? Because they have no source and they have no substance. They don't have Christ. And so they're blown like the wind. So once again, the psalmist reminds us again, you get to choose who you want to be. You can be like the tree or you can be by like the chaff, but you will be by, on, by like one of those. All right, I want to close with this. Here's what I want you to remember. I don't know if any of you saw this, but um, on Fox News, Arnold Schwarzenegger was asked about his belief in heaven. Did any of you see it? His response was horrible. He had a bunch of expletives, and then he would said, I don't believe in heaven. He says, there's no such thing. My heart breaks for that man. Because here's what I want you to know. After we die, we will all live somewhere. Did you hear me? We will all live somewhere. We either live with Jesus in heaven for eternity or we will be separated 
and thrown into the flames of hell for eternity. The psalmist tells us there are only two paths in life. The path that you're on right now will lead to your destiny. And so my question for you is this, are you on the right path? Are you on the path that leads to happiness or are you on the path that leads to total destruction and separation from God? Well, how do I know? Here's how you know. Remember I told you in Psalm chapter one, verses one through three, the psalmist is describing a man. You know who the man is that he's describing? Jesus. I can't live like that. I would love to be able, but you know what? I'm a sinner. My heart is evil, the Bible tells me. But I can live that life because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And because of my belief and because I've received the gift of grace from my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my future is secure. Christ is in me and I am in him. I'm not saved because of what I did. I am only redeemed and saved because of what Jesus did for me. Have you made that decision Do you know where you will be? The Bible makes it crystal clear. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt where you will spend eternity. There's two paths, my friend. Let's go back to that very first question I asked. It's not so stupid anymore, is it? Do you really want to be happy or do you want to be miserable? Jesus says there's one way to the Father, only one. And it's not what Pastor Bob says, it's what the Bible tells us. Remember what Jesus said? He said, in my house, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back so that you can be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I am going. I'm so thankful for Thomas. No, Lord, sorry, we don't know the way. How do we get there? And I'm sure Jesus is probably thinking, right on cue, Thomas, right on cue, because then he gives us the answer. Can you imagine his disciples hearing it for the very first time? And Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except by me. If you haven't made that decision yet, if you haven't figured that out in your life, right afterwards, we've got a group of people who are gonna be waiting there for you to help you with this, to answer your questions, and to make sure you're on that path that leads to righteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Psalms that make it crystal clear. Thank you that we know how to get refreshed, now we know how to stay refreshed. Father, I pray that this week, that as we spend time chewing on your word, that we would just remember, just tell somebody what it is you're eating and remind them about how good it is. Father, we know that there's a plan in place And you've invited us to join you in that plan. What a privilege it is. But Lord, I'm thinking about that one, or maybe that two or three, who are here today and they're just not quite sure. And they want to be sure. Lord, I pray through your Holy Spirit, give them the boldness, give them the courage to go to that starting point and ask those questions and to receive the answers that they've been looking for. Thank you for what you're about to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand? I want to give you the benediction and then dismiss you, okay? Now, I want to tell you, when I left, 
I know first service went to Dylan's and bought out all the watermelons. So I'm just telling you, there's a few left. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his strength. God bless you. Have a great week.